Um, and I'm not going to read it all, there's no time for that. I'm just going to try and summarize what I think this bit's about. We've got the beginning in Ezekiel 1. We have the dating. It's not so important, really, except to say this is happening on Earth. Ezekiel is getting a vision of heaven, which is actually on the Earth below. And that's just an important part of what it means. I'll talk about what it means in a minute. If you look at the description of these beasts, these living creatures in verse 5, they, um, they've got the appearance of human form and also part animal, part human, part animal. But we know that they're actually, there's a, they're in heaven above. There's a sort of heavenly residence for them. So this, they, these are actually not demonic, but they're actually um, what we might later call cherubim. And they're typical, actually, of what we see in Assyrian and Babylonian art. If you go to the British Museum, you see lots of lions and heads of humans um, in, the, in the bottom gallery, the Assyrian gallery. Uh, so it's not unusual that Ezekiel is picking up this image and obviously it's, it's party to it. But what's new is that there are four, and it's the faces which depict the animal types, human, lion, ox, and eagle, as it goes through in the description in Ezekiel chapter one. And they serve a mysterious figure on a sapphire throne. Obviously this figure is God, but it's not, um, the, it's not described in detail. God sitting there is not, um, presented in, in great detail, but there's a light which glistens like a rainbow all round it, a bow that's called round it. Um, and these are heavenly beings. And they had this chapter in Ezekiel had a huge influence in Jewish mysticism later on, uh, describing heavenly worship. But what on earth does it mean? What does it mean for Ezekiel? Well, Ezekiel had been a priest in the Jerusalem temple. He'd been forcibly exiled to a place called Babylon, uh, hence, the animals are typical of what he was seeing around, animal and human. And he found it hard, as a priest, that God could be present in an unclean land like Babylon. And his vision, um, this part here is partly a Paul as well, is God's way of showing him that heaven, where God dwells, as well as in the temple, and even more so, is everywhere, even in Babylon. God is which is just a means of Ezekiel being reassured of God's presence with him in this strange land. So that's Ezekiel, and you'll see why I brought this in, in a, when we move into the sanctuary. So let's look at the next one. So we've got heavenly creatures here in Ezekiel, living creatures, I hope in Hebrew, they're sort of the, um, serving God. But when we move to Daniel, Daniel 7, we get a very different picture of these four animals. They're certainly terrifying, bestial. Their place is not in heaven, but in the chaotic deep waters of the abyss, shale or hell, the great sea. Um, in verse two, the winds of heaven stir up the great, great sea. Four beasts come out of the sea, different from each other. There's still four, but they couldn't be more different from Ezekiel's cherubim. The first, in verse 4, is also a lion, a figure of power, and again popular in, in Babylonian art. But here, it's actually a figure of demonic power. It's not a figure of power serving God. Uh, again, um, the mm. winged lions make us think of, 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 of uh, the art in the ancient Near East. It's not just typically the Bible. Then we have a bear in verse 5, and a leopard, mm. four heads in verse 6. And then a beast like a dragon with ten horns in verse seven. Oh, These four beasts here represent four oh, kingdoms. Each kingdom was known to the people by a um, symbolic way. The lion represented to them Babylon. The lion was always uh, represented as Babylon. The bear was the Median Empire, the leopard was Persia, and the dragon was Greece. And certainly these four empires had each people much grief. And then as we move through as Daniel 7, we've got the four great beasts rising out of the earth. And then in verse um, 22, we've got, no, no, not 22, it's a bit further, in just a second. Um, we've, we've got the, oh, that's right, sorry, verse 9, much, much earlier on. Uh, we've got a, a figure, the ancient one, this is again a figure, it's meant to be of God himself, on a throne, clothing white as snow, hair of his body like pure wool, throne of fiery flames, and wheels with burning fire. 
Um, it's a little bit like Ezekiel's throne, but it's described in more detail. We certainly know that, therefore, we've moved from these horrible beasts of the sea to another vision of the heaven above. So there's this sort of this good and evil being thrown together here. The figures, as I say, it's got the clothing white as snow, and the wheels like burning fire. We have thousands serving him, going on in the past of Daniel 7, sitting in judgment, and suddenly ancient scrolls are opened. The fourth beast, as a consequence, is destroyed. That's the dragon that represents Greece. So we know that this, this, this whole image is telling us something about the downfall of the Greek Empire that was so terrifying, it pers was persecuting the people in a terrifying way. No. And then we, the, the vision ends with us seeing an angelic figure, one like a human being, in verses 13 to 4. And the ancient days promises him and his saints a kingdom which will cannot perish but will last forever. So what on earth does this vision mean? It's, it's got the animals, it's got four of them, that now no longer in heaven, they're coming out of the sea, that represent foreign nations and so on. I think what we have to remember is that this particular passage has been influenced by a time of persecution, a Greek ruler who actually demanded that the people worshipped him as God. And those who refused, and many of them were Jews, were killed for their defense. His name is Antiochus Epiphanes, it doesn't really matter, but that's that's um, it, that's the people they knew, that, that's he. They knew that, and the, the, the figure that's actually represented um, as, the, as the, um, the beast with the horns is meant to be Antiochus the Tenth Horn. So, which here shown how mighty empires come and go, and the Greek Empire under Antiochus will come to an end, God's kingdom will reign supreme. So, what we have in the Old Testament is really in symbolic language. The interplay between good and evil powers. The vision and the language are called apocalyptic, as we heard last week, because they unveil the purposes of God on earth. We might call each of them protest literature from a small and persecuted people facing imperial power. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. And that's why these two chapters in Ezekiel and Daniel are used so much in Revelation. So now let's move on to Revelation. The two, the two chapters here, and you'll see how we have an echo of what I've just been looking at in the opening of the chapters. The first one is Revelation 13. Here we've got the beast again arising out of the sea, reminding us very much of what we've just seen in Daniel 7. It's even got the ten horns, it's also got seven heads. It's like a leopard, it's, it, its feet are like a bear's, its mouth is like a lion's, it speaks like a dragon. We've got all the four animal figures that we have in Daniel all brought together in this one beast. The whole earth follows and worships this beast. It's evil in the extreme. Here, it doesn't represent the Greek empire, but the Roman empire, because under Nero and later Domitian, there were many persecutions of both Christians and Jews. So it's another way of describing the awfulness of persecution through animal, through, through the, the beasts. That's in Revelation 13. I don't want to, I'm trying to go quickly because I want us to, to get obvious to see why I'm using this in the section. Revelation is the next one. Now this one, if Revelation 13 is more like Daniel 7 and the awful beast from the sea, Revelation 4 is more like Ezekiel 1 and the cherubim and the beast is sort of part human, part divine, worshipping God. Revelation 4 introduces that we see an open door, the door to heaven. So the vision is really very much influenced by Ezekiel. The figure, there's a figure on a throne and there's a rainbow and here we have 24 elders in attendance, not the um, thousands that we had that was when we just, it was described heaven in Daniel, but 24, probably representing 12 apostles of the New Testament and the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament. And now look at the living creatures to describe in Revelation 4. We've got them um, in verses 6 onwards. One's like a lion, well, verses 7 and 8. One's like a lion. One like an ox, one has a human face, and one is like a flying eagle. Notice the figures coming up again. The reminders of those cherubim in Ezekiel, except they have six wings, not four. 
And rather than moving multidimensionally with wheels, as we've read in Ezekiel, and we went through that very quickly, but that's what was happening. These have many eyes, which enable them to see everywhere. These are the ones who are singing, holy, 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 and uh, reminding us of the song in, 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 in the prophet Isaiah. So there's worship going on here. Revelation 13 reminds us of the, the terror of the beasts. Revelation 4 takes us back to Ezekiel and these children. So they're again the battle between good and evil. Now the point I really wanted to make about Revelation um, 4 onwards, and it reminds me of what we read last week about the four horsemen, is that actually although there's a battle between good and evil, it, evil isn't conquered immediately. The, the four horsemen come and bring in awful plagues. Revelation straight after this one in, 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 in chapter four shows us how the, the, um, the beast is still there doing its worst. So the power, the evil of the powerful Roman Empire continue. We've just got assurance that the kingdom of God will one day break in on earth. So it's realistic in the way it deals with this sort of sense of power. Finally, and then we've got through our text, but you'll see why I've tried to do them when I start to talk about the, the apps itself. Finally, Revelation 5. Jesus as the Lamb. This is extraordinary. It comes as a complete surprise. We've got the, the, these figures, and we have 24 people worshipping. We have the scroll about to be opened, announcing the contents of God's kingdom. So we'd expect a further description of God and his throne matching the powerful thrones of this Roman Empire. Instead, we see a lamb standing by a throne with marks of having been slaughtered in verse five. This lamb is the only one worthy to open the scroll. Why this lamb? It's such a reversal of power. Of course, it's intended to be Jesus as he was known as the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world in the gospel of John. And indeed, he died on the cross as the, as the Passover lambs were being slaughtered on the temple. But in Revelation 5, we have a real interplay between weakness and strength. Interestingly, Jesus is also called in verse 5, the Lion of Judah. But then the Lamb dominates. From now on, this figure of the Lamb comes a further 23 times throughout the book of Revelation. I won't give you all the examples, but he comes immediately in, verses, in chapter 6 and 7. So what does this mean? Why the lamb? Well, firstly, it means that we have to wait for God's kingdom to break in. As I said earlier, it doesn't come all at once. Notice again that in chapter 6, it's those terrifying horsemen who follow this revelation about the lamb. But secondly, it means that God's kingdom will enter history in unexpected ways as it did in the person of Jesus. God's kingdom is not only about power, but also about service, love, and sacrifice. It's a kingdom with a crucified figure at the heart of it. This would have been anathema to the Romans. When Jesus died, it initially seemed that the power of Rome had won, deposing of the so-called Messiah of the Jews. Yet, here in Revelation 5, in difficult and symbolic visionary ways, we see that the crucified and risen Jesus lies at the heart of the kingdom of God, and his kingdom has a global reach far beyond the power of Rome. So Revelation is protest literature, just like Daniel was as well. It's about the mighty being put down and the meek raised up, as we read in the Magnificat. So those are the five texts. I've, I've gambled, you know, gone through them quite quickly. I've tried to show the contrast and I've done that because I think it'll all come to light when we start to look at the at the apps and the things, the figures up there. And then, Father Christopher, do you want do you want us to move now, or would it be easier? Can we all move up? I mean, all of us, all three of us, come come up, okay? And then I can try and explain what's going on in the apps. Yes, yes. 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 Yes.
Let's look at the most obvious image first. The one against the blue star in that one is Pat of Pat of the Bright Blue Moon. I can see, although some of you obviously may not be able to see them, you can probably know them, but a big red one with the red mountains in here, the stars, all the blue and the blue star, all the red mountains in here, and you can see the red mountains in here, and you can see the red mountains in here, and you can see the red mountains in here. This is a thousand of voices that we read in Daniel, or 24 elders that we read in Revelation. We now have 12. In fact, the father puts it upon the next few minutes, it needs to be 14 if you count them very carefully. They're not kneeling, but they're standing, but the standing of those permanent, most of them in pairs. So the immediate effect of this injury is to remind you that the price is the game. I said, I can live in the map and the world of power. This, of course, is an image of what is present in heaven, as much as on the earth. The reality of Jesus continues to learn. That's the point I was trying to make with you about Daniel as well as Revelation about the present in the world of power. There is no expectation of the world yet. Nothing of the earth. Before the great peace began to return, and the dragon was going to be the first to come to earth. Christ the Lord is coming to earth. We see four cherubim among the figures, which were in Ezekiel 3, in Ezekiel 1, and in Revelation 4. They're actually guardians for each side of the apse. You can now see there's four of them in those medallions. On the north side, we see a winged yield right at the top, a winged lion, a winged lion up high, and an eagle. Hang on, we've got this wrong. Sorry, it's, it's the other side. It's on the other side. On the south side, it's let me make sure this is right. A winged, the winged lion. I went very carefully through all this with the images, and I thought the winged lions there. That's right. So it's the south side. Yes, sorry. On the south side, we see a winged lion up high and an eagle below. On the north side, we see um, a winged um, a winged human figure and a winged ox like figure below. That's right. I've got the four now in, in the border. But you've got the animals here the same again. The, you've got the um, the human figure, the ox, the lion, and the eagle, all represented in, in this peculiar way. In Jewish tradition, these four figures were called cherubim, and they were the, they were the angels. Michael, who was the lion, Gabriel, who was the eagle, Raphael, who was the human, and Uriel, who was the ox. We actually see these angels in the mural up above on the north side. But in our Christian tradition, these four cherubim-like figures have been transformed into gospel writers. Which is which? There are at least six variations of Christian tradition of what each represents, but mostly we accept the authority of Jerome and Gregory, who pronounced the word as follows. Um, the, um, first of all, the six-winged six human figure stands for Matthew's gospel, uh, because his book begins with a human genealogy. The sixth winged ox is Luke, whose gospel starts with the offering of animal sacrifice. The sixth winged lion is Mark, whose gospel begins with a voice roaring in the wilderness. You can see how the beginning of the gospel is what the Triton might uh, make as an understanding of these. And the sixth winged eagle in John uh, is. Supposedly so because of the divine word 
which actually um, flies from heaven to earth. I mean, I think that's that's the other side is the eagle is the one bird that can face the sun and look in straight into the sun. And in John's gospel, we have the revelation of God presence on earth, um, which we can see um, in, in, in that same sort of, of, of way. But anyway, those are the representations. The cherubim in Ezekiel have now become the gospel writers. So what we have is that the actual, the gospel writers, as they stand here, become the key to helping us understand Revelation and the apocalypse and the Christ and the glory. But there's one other figure here too. It's the lamb. Immediately below the figure of Christ, well, immediately a long way below, the figure of Christ in glory. And so contrasting with it, because it's such a small figure, an animal, and yet um, it's immediately behind the crucifix and so highlighted. I think I'll just go up if I may, and just make, make sure that those of you... You might not be able to hear, you might not be able to hear you if you go too far away. Sorry? They might not hear you if you go too far away. Oh, right, okay. I will, I will, yeah. I'll come back. <laughs> and when you next come into church, I suggest you, you, you come into the sanctuary so before the altar step, and you look up to the, at the crucifix on the altar, and there's six candles, and immediately behind the crucifix, you'll actually see the lamb, the figure of the lamb. Now, this is an interesting figure. Um, it's carrying a flag, which in the Middle Ages was a symbol of military power. Jesus, the lamb in Revelation, is not represented in this way. You've had an image sent to you of um, a, a sixth century mosaic. I've actually got it on my computer, but I think I'll, I'll leave it for now. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mosaic in the ceiling of um, a basilica in Ravenna, the Basilica of San Vitale, which portrays a very different lamb. This is the sixth century, where you've got him sort of um, supported by angels, and yet it's a figure of, of both of suffering and of, of glory, but there's no sign of a flag or, or of anything like that at all. Um, I think if you think of the, there's a, a lamb in, there's a, um, uh, a, 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 something called the apocalypse, the um, trier apocalypse it's called. There are lots of um, pictures of revelation were done in the Middle Ages and it, was, it really excited sort of artists in a particular way. That lamb in, in, the, in, in that sort of, in that sort of um, depiction um, is standing by the throne, but it's got the seven seals under its, under its uh, front leg. The image in our apps is very, very different from that one. And also from that, some of you may know it, there's a Ghent altarpiece called Adoration of the Lamb. And again, those of you who are online will have an image of it, um, where you've got, the, it's by the Van Eyck brothers, with the lamb standing on an altar with blood pouring from his chest into a chalice below. It's, it's, it's very much in, in, uh, uh, part of the adoration of, 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 um, of the Virgin Mary as well. But what we have by contrast here, I'm trying to make the point, um, is a lamb carrying a flagpole topped with a cross, reminiscent of the heraldry used when armies went out to fight their own wars on earth. One example is the English Trinity Apocalypse, where the flag is of St. George. If you look at a French um, apocalypse <coughs> tapestry from Anjou, you'll see that the lamb's flag bears the arms of the house of Anjou. After all I've said about the power of God confronting the power of men, the symbolism of the lamb carrying a flag associated with military power might be slightly off, though it's a popular military for throne. throne. This having been said, the flag is of the cross, the cross is of St. George, and the lamb is a symbol of sacrifice and suffering. And this is made clear by the profusion of vine leaves and grapes surrounding it, symbolizing the wine we drink, which becomes for us the blood of Christ. Suffering and sacrifice therefore dominate. So we have these two contrasting figures. Now I just want to finish and then that we may be able to have questions. I'm not sure how it will work, but I just want to finish by saying, what on earth was the art architect Bromfield intending to convey with his assistants Heaton, Muffet, and May as they made this extraordinary apse and came under the stage? And I had two thoughts about it. I think the first is 
that we don't have to have much knowledge of the latter part of the 19th century, of 19th century history of Europe to realize the notion of empire was central to European, the European idea of national identity, both within and outside Europe. So the message of revelation with its emphasis on God's kingdom overcoming the might of human empires would have been particularly relevant. It actually also makes sense of the land with the flood poem indicating the interface between earthly powers and heavenly powers. Secondly, we have to remember that this iconography set above and below the Baldacchino, the Pantocrato, the Lamb, and then the Gospel writers um, were played an enormous role in the Tractarian movement from 1869 onwards. You may know that only St. Barnabas and St. Thomas has had vestments and a profusion of candles. Very few churches had incense and processions, and congregations rarely bowed and crossed themselves. So, this is not only a political statement. But it's a liturgical statement as well. The images of the four Gospels remind us that the central part of the Gospel is our liturgy of the Word. The image of Christ in glory reminds us of that song, Holy, 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 from Isaiah 6, which is what we sing during the course of the Mass. And the image of the Lamb in all its vulnerability reminds us of, God, of John's words about Jesus being the Lamb of God when we say, Lord God, Lamb of God, who take away the sins of the world, again, after, at, at the time of the broken bread, the broken, brokenness of the body of Christ. So there are political and religious things going on in this, um, this, this apt here, just as we saw in those texts that we had earlier. And so finally, the obvious question is, so what? What does it mean to us today, not least during this season of Advent? The depiction of Revelation 4 and 5 could not be more relevant after two years of the pandemic and now the terrible atrocities resulting from the Russian Ukrainian hostilities and now Israel, Gaza, and Palestinian hostilities too. Many times we've been made to think what it might be like to be caught up in a third world war. So, as in the 19th century, so now, the imagery in this house reminds us of a different response to the power of military might. As we become increasingly aware of our impotence and vulnerability on a global level, we're reminded that there is another kingdom, present but invisible, a kingdom not only of power and might, but of sacrifice and service, a kingdom where there is true regard for all humanity. So all this is incredibly important at this point in time. So we move from those bizarre texts in Ezekiel 1 and Daniel 7, to the more symbolic texts in the New Testament and Revelation, those three chapters, to looking at the apps now and trying to ask what it meant to those who put it together, to trying to see what it means to us today. So that's what I've tried to do in those stages. So thank you for your attention. I feel I'm talking to a, <laughs> a strange sort of <laughs> group, but I'm totally happy to have questions. Or, yeah, well, um, if you just sit there, then. Yeah, well, you just sit here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to sit where you can see me. I wasn't sure whether you could put it or not. Anybody got anything to say um, or to ask or to comment on? You can ask me anything about those odd texts or um, anything I've said since then. It's fine. Happy not to ask questions. It may have been too, too much all at once. <laughs> this may be a question for somebody else, but let me try it. Speak up. In the last bit, you talked about the architect of the church. Would he have had that degree of freedom, or would he have been in, under instruction? I think Thomas Kuhn gave him quite a lot of freedom, didn't he? He said, you know, he, he, and he even said as much money was almost no object. It was extraordinary how he allowed. I think Bromfield had far more freedom than perhaps Burgess at Worcester Chapel, where he was subject to the governing body, if that's what you mean. But I think, I think Bromfield actually did have a good deal of freedom in what he could put here. And it was quite radical. I mean, some of the things he was doing. Well, that was really what I was trying to get at. I mean, yeah, was he was he a 
distinguished theologian or member of the Tractarian movement himself. Um, but all Fields I know about him is that Thomas Hardy was apprenticed to him. <laughs> yes, John Fields' brother was a bishop. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. So I think he was carefully chosen yes, as yes. the architect I see. because of his uh, reputation. So I think he yes, also he done the chapel in the um, in the Ratcliffe Infirmary. He did yeah. before he done the you know the, yeah. the chapel that's on the Ratcliffe Infirmary site. So oh, you know, it's a point of exactly. oh right okay well <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's interesting to ask about intentions of people when they do things. We'll never know, and I've not read anything about it. I was just trying to sort of work out why there is this emphasis on a bit like in Keeble too on Christ in glory and might and power but alongside that the emphasis on suffering and sacrifice with that tiny little figure of the lamb below and then the strange imagery of the of the um, of the gospel writers picking up the imagery of the animals the winged winged creatures in Ezekiel and so on but now no longer cherubim in heaven but gospel writers I just think there's there must have been a lot going on in what, what they were trying to do. Um, I think they were trying to combine a lot of uh, interpretation and, and, into mm, one mm, kind of sanctuary. Yeah. I think they were trying to sort of create a lot of symbolism in, yeah. and, redefi and redefine it for the, for the yeah. generation ahead. Yeah. Uh, Just online, online, sorry. Yes, Sorry, right. just to say, online the picture was amazing. Um, thank you so much, Sue, for that. That was a, that was a really fascinating talk. But um, you know, looking, we, I mean, I have never stood there in the church itself in that way and looked up. But the camera image that we got we had this amazing sense of the liturgy being sort of symbolised in architecture, with the the pillars of the walls being the first part of the liturgy, and then a kind of glimpse into the heavenly realm as you look up. It was amazing. So thank you. <laughs> That's very good of you. Now, I think you had probably a better deal than we did because those those images, they were not mine, of course, they were Father Christopher's. Were absolute, they're absolutely superb. I mean, they really do capture everything in a way which is hard when you're sitting under it to sort of to, to have. But uh, it's just, I just now, you know, I just always will think of Revelation 4 and the reading of that up there with Christ in glory and Revelation 5, the juxtaposition of the two, the, 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 the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. The two, you know, are, are very poignantly together, very different. But yeah, but if you want to ask any questions, feel free as well. I mean, the architect was very inspired theologically mm -hmm. because when you have a summer's day and the light is coming in with those clear story windows, yes, yeah, you can you can tell he knew what he was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And was the Baldacchino part of the original design? Mm, yes, yes. I didn't make too much of that. I was trying to talk about the images. But the fact it's there and the fact it's so unusual, it's very, very different to making a very big statement about the Tractarian movement at that time, shows that a lot of what we're seeing is definitely a liturgical statement as much as it is a political one. I think it's. I mean, if you look at very, very old photographs of the church from the 1890s, it's exactly the same. Mm. In fact, what sometimes is 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 there is a curtain um, covering over the vines on the lamp. For some reason, they had like a curtain across behind the altar. Uh, you can actually see the the rails if you go up close enough mm. to see. There's still the rails there. I don't know why, whether why why they covered that gold reredos over, but it was all there. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's been restored in the early twentieth century, but the, the Christ in glory was always there. It was all the Valentino was always there. Mm -hmm. um, the bits that were added to the church later with the tower, the, the camp oh, yes, yeah. uh, and obviously the Lady Chapel was extended a bit. I think the other point I was trying to get over was how I was surprised anyway to find how serene it is. You know, I mean, I, I called it the beast of the sea and I was actually expecting, to be honest, when before I really got into it, to find some gesture of the 
existence of evil here, but it's actually very much more a statement of a positive statement of yes. the might of God and the suffering as well, the might of, of Christ at the right hand of God and the suffering of Christ before and so on. Um, but there isn't, there is nothing which you get, for example, at Fairford, the last the window of the last judgment in Fairford and so on, where it's terrifying, you know, all full of um, of, of, of all the stuff I was reading with you in Daniel 7, particularly in Revelation 13. But this is not here. It's all very definitely a quiet, calm statement of Christ in glory, who's give, got that glory through the suffering of the cross. And yeah, it's a, it's a theological as well as political statement in that sense. Hmm. Hmm. Sue, um, can you hear me? It's Claire. I can. Oh, right. Well, thank you very much for your talk. I'm, well, one thing I've spotted on the images on the website, which were great to have a look at, is the four images on the sides, um, they've got all these eyeballs on them. Oh, um, God. Eyes. I, eyes. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, you're right. Yes, go on. Yeah, and, and I, does that have significance? I find it now, looking at it in detail, quite eerie. Yes. I'm wondering what, what exactly that is saying. I'm, I don't know if you covered this, because I there was a little section where I didn't hear very well, but um, is there a significance to those eyes? Yes, it's deliberately picking up uh, the imagery that you have of these figures um, in, in Revelation chapter 4, where it talks about them having many eyes. And right. in Ezekiel, these figures have not got many eyes, but they've got many wheels. They move around. And there's, you know, there's this idea of them being everywhere all at once. It's a sort of, if they represent God, it's trying to say God's everywhere all at once too. So they're all moving. And it changes in Revelation 4 to them being all seeing, like God, all seeing. And so I think the eyes, although they are, I like you argue, they are, they're, you know, their heads and eyes, it looks like a peacock sometimes if you're looking at the mm -hmm. eagle. Um, they, they are quite strange, but then they're symbolic. Their wings are, a bit, are weird too. You know, fancy having a lion. Well, there is a, the Babylonians have lions with wings, but fancy having an eagle with I mean, not an eagle with wings. An eagle with six wings is is a strange thing. So it's all symbolic, and I think the eyes are part of all that idea of it being. You know, it's the all all seeing these creatures. The, oh right, yeah. Given the gospel, the gospel writers, you know, their perception into hidden things and so on, I think is is what's coming out as well. But it does come from Revelation four. Had you not noticed that before, Claire? And Jeff? No, no, I hadn't really. Wow. Um, no, I hadn't. So, and I saw that on those very good um, photos that you've taken, which which are great to look at. I yeah. I do think that someone once told me that originally those four were were black, black and white and then when it was restored it was painted gold at a later point could be yes could be. my goodness i didn't know that i've never i've read quite a I, lot but i never read that heard about that yeah was that ricky told you that yes i think it must have been father christopher i mean i he he seemed to know a lot about the history of the decoration so the whole of the apps was once black and white or these images no just those four images and oh, i think that really bizarre yeah okay well he would know yeah well I, I, I might i might go and try and check in in some of the documents he, he left me because i find that quite interesting yeah <laughs> it's certainly true as they are they they absolutely blend in with all that's been said you know everywhere yeah. else. it would stand out really horrifically if they were black and white yeah. Well, thank you, Claire. I shall. Well, I've read. I've read a lot. Of, Anne Abley's work as well. Um, I read quite a lot of that as well as Rinky's to try and get the background. And I didn't read, didn't catch it. I'm. I must have missed it. Well, I, I I'll go and try and find out. But I mean, I might. I'm not hundred percent sure. I've got no, that well, right. Thank you. But, but yeah. I do remember that at some point it was changed to gold. Something was changed to gold. So yeah. Hmm? 
I would try to do extra reading as well about how these cherubim change into gospel writers. Because what, what a strange thing you have these cherubim in heaven, you know, these android creatures with wings and eyes and goodness knows what, and suddenly they get transformed as symbols of each of the gods of, of, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And um, I have a chart which shows you there were at least eight variations of, you know, the eagle could be Mark, the ox could be Luke, because the ox and in, in the ox mass and so on, Matthew. So you've got, so there are all sorts of reasons given for why each of the, um, uh, you know, the, the creatures might be identified with a different image of the cherubim. But I just found that I, I haven't yet found out, I mean, it's not just about our images of the church, but how it happened that the that Ezekiel's cherubim and the cherubim in, in, in Revelation 4 should then become images of the gospel writers. And I think that's, uh, that's something I haven't fully, um, you know, really got to the bottom of. If anybody's got any explanation, I'd be very interested. It was, by the way, I ought to say the identification of them with these figures is very early. It goes back to Jerome, so we're actually in the th fourth century, really, or well, fifth, certainly, yeah, fourth, fifth century, and Gregory, so again, two centuries after. So it's, you know, it's not, not a late identification, it's a very, very early one in the Western Church. You mean typifying the ego? Mm, the yes, place. yeah. It was Jerome and Gregory who used this, the, the explanation, I, yeah, yeah, that we have. Um, but there are other variations as well throughout the Middle Ages. Mm. I'd be interested if any of you have got anything to say as well about the 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 lamb with the flag, you know, the flagpole, because it is a standard image from from the early Middle Ages, um, certainly from the post Carolingian, but certainly from the tenth, eleventh century. Um, uh, we've got the, um, the, the 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 lamb standing with the flag in all sorts of apoc illustrated apocalypses, um, and it's it's just an interesting military image, though we can actually make something of that as I tried to do in the talk, but uh, it is it is a, an interesting one given what we've we've got here. It's sort of is a flag, is it? It's not sometimes a long, long sword with a banner on it. It occurs it to, to me the notion of, yeah. of the lamb representing both self-sacrifice and sacrifice yeah. would be picked up by him holding a long sword yeah. with the point Pointing towards his own neck. Yeah, I think it. It's usually a cross. Yeah, well, like swords are, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> no, this is a. This is definitely a. It's flag. definitely yeah, a. Flag. No, no, it's certainly got yeah. a flag on the yeah. top. Yeah. The question yeah. is what's going what's on. What's what's it? There. Yeah, whether it, it, there's, there's a sword. Or it's just a flag I think it, I thought it was. I mean, those of you who've got the images will be able to see more clearly than I can. <laughs> um, it, Often you get the images of the resurrection of the Christian Jesus at the time. Yes, yes, yes. Or Jesus. Yes, yeah, yeah, well. yeah. So, sort of. And it's interesting, it's always this interplay between earthly and heavenly power and might. You know, you use political symbols of power to make a theological point about God's power and might. So it's, it's, it's not odd, but it, 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 I just thought it was a little bit odd with the lamb involved in it, in this particular. Juxtaposition. Hmm. And there's no doubt about it when you come close and you look at all the vines, the tendrils of the vines that come out of, you know, most of the other um, plates that you've got that run alongside aren't, you know, curve round from the, the picture of, of, the, of the lamb are all tendrils of vines and grapes. So immediately you made to think of the of, of the blood of the lamb. So it's, it's certainly, that the sacrificial idea is, as you said, it is absolutely paramount at that, at that point.
Any more questions from online? We'll say thank you very much. No, not at all. And next week, of course, we've got a real expert in Revelation. We could not have somebody who is better known. He's an international scholar on the book of Revelation. So he's willing to come and talk here. I mean, he's in Oxford, so and, and he loves Revelation, so he'd be happy to. So I think you'll find his ideas quite interesting. And it's next Tuesday, not Wednesday. Next Tuesday evening at 7. Yeah. Tuesday the 19th, yeah. not Wednesday. Yeah. Just to make things more complicated. <laughs> Can I just put forward a, a book? I just want to go and get it just to finish with. A book which I think some of you who like art might be interested in looking at. Mm. Oh. You know, I think one or two of you may know what this is. This is called Picturing the Apocalypse. And it's by Natasha O'Hare and her, actually her father, Anthony O'Hare, and Dermot's put a, um, a, 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 an endorsement on the back of it. And it's a really good account, if you like art history, of the history of Revelation through the centuries, through um, different tapestries, different apocalypses. That's what I was trying to refer to one or two mosaics, stained glass, modern art. It's a, it's a feast if you interested in the symbolism. So picturing the apocalypse, the book of Revelation and the arts over two millennia, Natasha O'Hare and Antony O'Hare. And I'm not selling it because Natasha was a student of mine, but uh, I'm uh, proud of what she's done. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thanks all very much indeed. Thank you. Yes, yeah.